Okay, this will be the last installment in our fourth series looking at ingredients for severe thunderstorms. And we're focusing on mesoscale lift, specifically with the dry line, the vertical circulation, and how that can be conceptualized into a model to estimate the likelihood of storm development. Okay, storm initiation. We've talked about QG theory a little bit and the scale of ascent. Just as a reminder, 10 centimeter per second ascent over six hours results in a little over two kilometers of vertical displacement. You should see cloud formation and lift over broad areas, and storms will just pop up within the broader cloud sheets if it's truly large scale ascent initiating the storms. So again, QG processes largely set up the environment for severe storm development. Through, and also the response to cyclogenesis with differential advection is a big role. Most surface-based thunderstorms do not form as a direct consequence of QG ascent. So we're, we have to look on the mesoscale for excuses for why we would get storms forming in small bands or at points. Okay, we've seen examples with fronts. The circulation in response to frontogenesis rising air on the warm side. And we have the slope frontal surfaces where some people somewhat erroneously refer to it as overrunning as the informal term, but it's really isentropic upglide, or that's a fancy way of saying warm advection. So you'll see warm advection sloping toward the cold side of the front with height, and that's also a portion of the QG omega equation, which is warm advection. Now the dry line, we've got a different conceptual model based on observations. Again, the dry line's associated with the Lee trough, it's usually not particularly bare clinic, so there's no strong frontal circulations per se, but we have a way to estimate how deep is the band of ascent on the dry line and can you initiate storms. And then on another one, which I won't focus on here, but we have outflow boundaries, same kind of thing. It's the lift, it's a smaller scale front. The lift is proportional to the depth of the cool air. And you know, those are, there are plenty of other sources you can come up with. Okay, so I'm gonna show a case, we'll show two satellite images, how the storms initiate, and the point here is to get you to think about what's initiating the convection here. We see a couple of storms in western Oklahoma forming at a few points. There are a few stratocumulus clouds around, but not a big sheet of cloud cover. So you wouldn't expect that this is large scale ascent. Just looking at satellite, you would think something on the mesoscale in this narrow zone in western Oklahoma is responsible for the ascent that's initiating convection. Okay, so we have some soundings that are a little bit further to the east, but this is from that day to illustrate what was going on synoptically. So if we had synoptic scale ascent, this is the kind of modification to the profile. We would expect the 18Z sounding to look more like this one, this modified version where we've seen the moisture increase from below and it looks like saturated ascent. And that's if you had, the, again, the typical synoptic scale, 10 centimeter per second for approximately six hours. Okay, so this is the Norman sounding from that morning. Again, this is well east of the dry line. Here's the 18Z sounding in Norman. This does not show the signs of background ascent going on. Because if you notice, all that's really happened with this profile is we've warmed and moistened in the low levels, but that mixed layer only doesn't even come close to 850 millibars. So the vertical mixing is all down near the ground. The depth of the moist layer hasn't really changed. So if we're gonna get storms to the immediate west of here, it's not specifically like QG processes that are driving it in this case. Because again, we don't see the modification. We didn't see the moistening. This moist layer should be deepening with time. You should see that change. And there are times where you can see soundings change like that. This one doesn't show it. So what's actually going on? It's the mesoscale band of ascent along the dry line. If you recall, we mentioned something on an order of a meter per second for an hour or so, gives you about three and a half kilometers of vertical displacement. Now these zones are narrow and storms should start as points or little bands if that's what's driving it. So if we take this sounding, let's apply a conceptual model here. This is what would have happened if you had one hour of one meter per second ascent on that sounding. And this is the same example I showed before for the scales of vertical motion. You've completely eliminated the base of the elevated mix layer, the convective inhibition, we've deepened the moist layer along the moist adiabat. This is a sounding where there would already be deep convection before it even got to this point. So we would easily initiate storms if we have an hour of one meter per second ascent. 
Okay, so the dry line itself, can we get that strength and depth of vertical motion? Okay, the, how do we estimate this using the real world dry line? Well, the depth of mixing on the moist side and the dry side are used in combination to figure out how deep the dry line circulation is based on observations. You need a deep mix layer west of the dry line. You want that mixing to be as deep as you can get it with daytime heating. And then the vertical motion along the dry lines, the maximum tends to scale with the height of the moist layer. So the higher the moist layer, the depth of the moist layer is on the moist side, and the deeper the depth of the mixing is on the dry side, the more likely it is that you will have a circulation that is deep enough and strong enough to initiate storms. The other thing that's critical is how long do the storms stay in the zone of ascent because it's not very wide. We're only talking 10, 20 kilometers maximum. It's not going to be something that's going to persist for a long period of time. So we've got to keep the air parcels in that zone of ascent, which depends on the flow relative to the dry line. So you want the low tropospheric flow to kind of parallel the dry line to keep the updrafts in that zone of ascent. And the longer, the better. Okay, so here's the dry line case from the same one we looked at. I've sketched it in across western Oklahoma. We've got the confluence in the low levels, temperatures well into the even in 99 degrees at Childress, and it was southwest winds 20 to 30 knots, and then south or southeast winds with dew points near 70 into western Oklahoma. So the dry line is that transition, and notice that it's oriented mostly north-south. Okay, so we take the sounding from Amarillo at 12Z, and then we look at what happened to it if we apply surface heating and mixing, we take the temperatures that we found in the dry air, we apply that to the sounding, and we get a very deep mix layer. So it was easy to see with this Amarillo sounding, with this shallow inversion, that it's easy to get pretty deep mixing once the temperatures warm up, and this is just, once they warm up into the 80s, you're going to mix through a very deep layer. Okay, so we've got a mix layer depth that goes up to somewhere between 600 and 500 millibars, very deep. And that's on the dry side. Now here's the sounding from Norman, the special sounding at 18Z. There's the depth of the dry side mixing on the dry side of the dry line. And then here's the depth of the mix layer or the moist layer on the moist side. So remember, the maximum vertical motion is going to be near the top of the moist layer on the east side, which is around 850 millibars. And the entire circulation will extend up to somewhere between 600 and 500 millibars. So we've got a nice deep circulation. Notice this sounding, where's the level of free convection? For that sounding is around 700 millibars. So it's within the range of the circulation of the dry line. So that's the key is that we're focusing on that. If you can keep parcels in that zone of ascent, again, you don't have observations to say, well, I know the updraft today is 1.2 meters per second versus 0.9 meters per second. We don't know. The only proxy you have for that would be the more convergent the surface winds look along the dry line, probably the stronger the ascent is, but that's, that's the only way to really estimate it. But here, also consider the winds through that layer. Around the level of free convection, they're all south-southwest, and this is only a couple hours before convective initiation. Remember the orientation of the dry line? It was like north-northeast, south-southwest, skewed just a little bit to the east of north-south. That's pretty much parallel to those winds. So what happens is air's coming in at the low levels, it's ascending in that dry line circulation, but it's staying parallel to and along the dry line until it reaches a level of free convection, and then we initiate storms. If these winds veered to westerly too quickly, the air would come in, try to rise, but then it would detrain. It would move out of the dry line circulation before it was lifted high enough to reach the level of free convection. So again, we just plopped the Amarillo sounding, the modified one on top, and we would suggest in this case, thunderstorm initiation seems probable, even though we have a fairly strong cap. We have big, large buoyancy, but a fairly strong cap. But you can imagine on the higher terrain to the west, where it's a little bit warmer, there's less convective inhibition anyway. We just don't have any sounding there. With the depth of this circulation, even with that Norman sounding, there's a reasonable chance for storm initiation. So again, we focus back, and we indeed got storms. And if anyone remembers what happened this day, it wasn't just storms. There were like three or four violent tornado-producing supercells, including a couple of them later that were coming right toward us here in Norman. So it was a very interesting evening in central Oklahoma, unfortunately. So again, summarizing this, without even relying on a numerical model, 
output, you can actually come up with a conceptual model to say, hey, I think, can I estimate whether or not I expect storms on the dry line? So again, one meter per second ascent, it only takes about an hour. Can you keep the parcels in that zone of ascent long enough to reach a level of free convection? And when you see storms forming in little points or bands like that, it's almost certainly something on the mesoscale that's driving it. 